Uh, let me begin by, uh, first of all, welcoming all of you to this afternoon's uh, panel. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris Eisgruber. I'm the university uh, provost and will be serving as moderator for this afternoon's session. Uh, I also want to begin by uh, thanking our co-sponsors uh, for this event. This is a, it has taken a bit of a village to uh, put together this um, panel, bringing together diverse perspectives. And um, Mommy, don't stand on. Just come on down, Professor. Uh, Jamal has made her way through the rain, so uh, we decided to go ahead and uh, get started as people were uh, filing in. But I, I want to thank the Office of Religious Life, uh, the Program in Law and Public Affairs, the Mamdua S. Bope Center for Peace and Justice, and the Woodrow Wilson School, all of which are co-sponsors of this afternoon's uh, event. And I am exceedingly grateful for the many people affiliated with those offices who have uh, provided important support for this event and made it possible. I want to start off with a little bit of background about the uh, occasion for this event and, and how the panel uh, came about. It is prompted by the activity of a movement called the Yala Young Leaders Initiative, two representatives from that initiative with us, an online Facebook-based movement dedicated to empowering young Middle Easterners to lead their generation to a better future. On July 9th, 2011, the New York Times published an article by Ethan Bronner in which he suggested that uh, Yala's initial successes, and I'm quoting now, suggest that the Facebook-driven revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt may offer guidance for coexistence efforts as well. Yala first came to my own attention, not as a result of Ethan Bronner's article, but uh, because of a letter that Ambassador Uri Severe sent last spring, asking whether or not there was anyone at Princeton who might be able to help with a planned online educational initiative that Yala was sponsoring. As some of you may know, Ambassador Severe was one of the negotiators of the Oslo Accords. His current role is as director and honorary president of the uh, Perry Center for uh, Peace, and he was one of the people in that capacity who helped to launch the Yala movement. After some correspondence uh, back and forth in response to his letter, I suggested that Yala might be able to capitalize on some of the online educational materials uh, that Princeton and several other universities were beginning to put online through Coursera. And it appears that uh, that collaboration will, in fact, uh, take place. In further exchanges, he and I agreed that a, uh, that a discussion of YALA and similar movements might be of interest to people on our uh, campus um, interested in issues about uh, edu online education, peacemaking, and the Middle East. And that brings us to uh, the panel we've assembled here uh, today. I'm at this point going to introduce them, and then I'm going to take a seat and let each of them uh, speak. Um, I have asked each of them to speak for only about uh, 10 minutes, which I, I feel vaguely guilty about, given that three of them have traveled very long distances uh, in order to get here. And in fact, I've been so insistent about this instruction that a couple of them have started to tease me about it. But I think it's worthwhile because uh, at many of these panels, the question and answer exchange that follows after the formal presentations is the best part of the panel. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to uh, reserve some time to hear questions from you and exchanges among our uh, panelists. So let me now uh, introduce each of them in the order that they will uh, speak, beginning with our representatives of the uh, online initiative. Uh, Mahadi Jaber, who is seated in the center of the panel, is a Palestinian American from uh, Beit Hanina, Jerusalem. Mahadi is currently finishing his undergraduate and general education courses at Skyline Community College in San Bruno, California. He hopes to pursue further academic studies in political science and international relations, or medicine, he told me uh, when we met earlier today. As a member of Yala Young Leaders, Mahadi has actively participated in both its online and offline activities, including previous presentations to the 2011 Clinton Global Initiative University and the U.S. Agency for International Development. Megan Hallahan, who is seated on the uh, on your right as you look at the panel, is the uh, project manager for the Yala Young Leaders Online Academy. Megan has been working in the field of international peace building and development for the previous nine years. 
Among her prior positions were Secretary General of the Ara Pasis Initiative, Office Manager and Director of Peace Programs at Global Forum Italy, and Director of Intercultural Programs and Director of the Executive Office at the Global Forum. Moti Crystal, who is seated be, uh, next to Mahadi, is the Chief Executive Officer of Negotiation Strategies Limited and founder of the Nest Group. From 1994 to 2001, he served as an Israeli negotiator in discussions with Jordanian and Palestinian counterparts. He has taught negotiation dynamics at various universities, including Skolkovo in Moscow, Tel Aviv University, and the Lauder School of Government at the Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya. Our final two speakers will both be from our own faculty. Professor Mitch Denier, next to uh, uh, Megan, uh, is the Maurice P. During Professor of Sociology here at Princeton. His books include Slim's Table, Sidewalk, and An Introduction to Sociology. He is a true multimedia professor, having produced an ethnographic film, also titled Sidewalk, and having this summer taught Princeton's very first Coursera offering, also titled Introduction to Sociology, for which he had more than 40,000 students around the world. And last but certainly not least, my far right, Professor Amani Jamal is Associate Professor of Politics, Director of the Workshop on Arab Political Development, and Director of the Mamdoua S. Bope Center for Peace and Justice here at Princeton. Her books include Barriers to Democracy, which won the American Political Science Association's 2008 prize for the best book in the field of comparative democratization and which explores the role of civic associations in promoting democratic practices in the Arab world. I hope you will join me in welcoming this distinguished group of panelists and I will turn things over to them to get us started. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank everyone for giving me the opportunity to be here. Like as he mentioned, I'm Mahdi Jaber. Uh, I uh, I'd first like to start off by saying uh, Yellow Young Leaders was uh, inspired by the Arab Revolution, which <coughs> took place. And uh, a couple months after the revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt, uh, we developed an online platform using Facebook called Yellow Young Leaders just for Middle Eastern youth of all ethnic backgrounds and uh, nationalities to have a place online to just have dialogue, it, be it talking about the weather or talking about serious issues of, of uh, politics. Uh, and it may seem like a small step, but when you look at the Middle East it, in such a tumultuous time where you have Israeli youth in uh, 20 minutes to the south, you have Palestinian youth who've never, who don't know each other, who don't know the simplest of things about each other, this is a very a very big thing to have Israeli and Palestinian and Jordanian and uh, Tunisian youth just talking. And uh, Yellow Young Leaders, it first started off and we were proud to have 10,000 members the first couple months. Uh, it, but as we've progressed and moved on and we've realized that the the dialogue and the, the uh, the collaboration between the youth is is truly inspiring, and uh, we've we've realized that we can we have to take this from being just an online uh, collaborative platform to being uh, a center, to being a, uh, a focal point of all these youth's desires to be active participants of, of social change. And uh, Yellow Young Leaders is 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 the uh, is the platform uh, for them to do this. Uh, um, we uh, in uh, what's a, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, in uh, the first couple months, we realized that our our participation was growing rapidly. We, as I said, we started off at 10,000. We have almost 200,000 members now, consisting of members of 70,000. Our our strongest country is Egypt with 70,000 members. Uh, Palestine has 13,000 members. Israel coming with a 7,000 member strong community. And it ranges from all over the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa, Algeria around 20,000. Uh, one of our most conservative countries, Saudi Arabia, at least has 2,000 active members. And uh, there's not one country in the Middle East or North Africa that we don't have uh, membership and we don't have uh, collaboration going on. Uh, 
Another thing I would like to bring up is uh, is the fact that Yellow Young Leaders is not just an uh, online platform for dialogue anymore. We're trying to move it into a, a movement for social justice, a movement for for youth in the Middle East, which constitute two-thirds of the entire population of the Middle East. Two-thirds of 300 million people is quite, quite a large number. And uh, we want them to feel free to have a voice online because the political and, and barriers are just so strong in each country, in our respective country. Uh, Yell Young Leaders is, uh, in my opinion, it, it's great just for the sure fact of the humanization effect that's going on between Israeli and Palestinian, especially. Although we do take up a lot of the attention, Israeli and Palestinians, it's not just for us, it's for all people of the Middle East. But naturally, we kind of take up a lot of the spotlight. But uh, I, I just want to stress uh, the humanization effect that does take place. And the, I mean, it's never happened before. We've had an online conference which had 40,000 members uh, online all at the same time. And to this date, this is the largest online conference to take place. And uh, it, as I stated before, it was people from all over the Middle East. Every country was involved. And we use this online conference as a way for each of our members to state what they wanted in their country to change, what they viewed most important, be it women's rights in Saudi Arabia or social justice in Israel. Uh, we're really trying to make our online platform the focal point of that. And um, uh, I would also like to stress that, that uh, be it we, we're moving from just a Facebook page to our own page, or be it that we are moving from just this online platform to a movement that will hopefully have an academy that will train young leaders to do what they want to do, to bring the, the change they want in their society, to, uh, to have the, uh, an academy just if you want to be a volunteer or if you want to just move yourself up educational-wise, to have Yale Young Leaders be that platform and have it be easily accessible online. Not just to have it online, but have it be easy, easily accept, accessible to people in Libya, people in, in small towns in Nablus, in Tulkaram. We want it to be accessible. We don't want it to be just something that the well-off can have. It is really something for the youth, by the youth. And uh, and I, I fully support it, and I, and I hope you guys do too. <laughs> Thank you, Monty, and thank you, Provost Steisgruber, for your hospitality and your tireless efforts in putting this event together today and our visit here. Um, to expand a bit more about the activities of Yala Young Leaders, uh, Yala has outlined its core values and vision for the region um, in a document that we call the MENA Initiative. And the MENA Initiative is divided into a uh, declaration of principles and a detailed call to action regarding democracy, human rights, economic development, regional peace, including a two-state solution, putting an end to occupation, violence, terror, rejection, and hatred, and adhering to peaceful cooperation based on self-determination, equality, mutual respect, cooperation, and security for all. The initiative has been conveyed to regional and world leaders and we have actually just uh, received a response uh, today from David Hale, Special Envoy for Middle East Peace at the U.S. State Department, who writes to us that the results of your Berlin summit and concluding statement from this network of young regional leaders from across the region is truly remarkable. The Yala Mena Initiative for Peace and Economic Cooperation complements U.S. goals in the region, and I welcome you. Uh, so this is just one example of uh, the work that Yala is doing on the advocacy <coughs> side. Uh, we are also developing a number of concrete projects uh, based on needs and ideas expressed by our members during our online conferences, as Monty mentioned, and the ongoing dialogue, which happens every day on our Facebook page. Um, among the projects that are now under development are an online 
accelerator for startup companies an online media portal for musical and video development and collaboration an alternative tourism initiative and our flagship program the Yala Online Academy or ELOA uh, the idea behind ELOA is to supplement the higher education opportunities available in the Middle East with courses from some of the top universities from around the world as well as cutting edge practical training from leading corporations like Microsoft, Facebook, and HP. The goal is to help our members to become the political, social, or economic leaders they seek to be, offering them training in 21st century skills like social networking, uh, public diplomacy, online activism, leadership, and cross-cultural communication and conflict resolution. Uh, through online courses from Princeton and other leading universities delivered through a special community on the Coursera platform, as well as supplementary webinars and online modules and activities, ELOA will provide its members with the opportunity to learn new skills while interacting and working collaboratively with their peers from across the Middle East. In this way, ELOA will help to foster a new generation of open-minded, forward-thinking leaders across the MENA region. It will be the first cross mena Arab-Israeli academic institution of its kind. Although ELOA is partnering with universities and institutes from across the globe, YALA sees great importance in partnership with U.S. universities as they are among the leading in the world and their faculty and students have a wealth of experience to share as well as to gain from collaboration with YALA young leaders. So we are very happy to be here today and look forward to uh, hearing from you and to hopefully working together. Can I take it from the... Uh, yes, this, is, this would be the better one. It's the only way to guarantee that I will not text while... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, this is... Uh, uh, good afternoon and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, you mentioned Provost, uh, 10 minutes. It reminds me the great story about this CNN reporter who uh, was asked to prepare a short uh, news clip about the Middle East peace process. So he walks down the main street of Jerusalem. Uh, the first Israelis he sees on the street is stuck a microphone and so like, Hi, I'm from the CNN. Uh, would you describe me or what, what do you think about the Middle East peace process? Or, oh, CNN. Uh, look, it's very <laughs> complex. And uh, No, no, no. CNN. News bite. One word. What do you think about the peace process? So I said, good. <laughs> so the CNN reporter, I have no news here. So, would you elaborate, please, two, three words? Not good. <laughs> so that's, uh, you know, ten minutes. Um, <laughs> Good. Uh, for, 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 for many years, uh, I strongly objected what is known in our region as the peace tourism or peace industry, which means the same uh, 200 people from the Israeli side and 200 people from the Palestinian side are um, wasting uh, European and American taxpayer monies and going and travel to uh, you know, very nice places in Europe, uh, talk themselves to death, and uh, the good results of these peace efforts you've seen. Uh, <laughs> one day, but this changed with the, um, what you call the Arab Spring or the Arab Revolution, because suddenly we've realized that the masses can communicate uh, among themselves beyond government. And then I got the call from Uri Savir, Ambassador Savir. Um, I worked with him in, in the 90s, and he said, uh, uh, Moti, this is Uri, like we didn't speak to we for like a day or two. Yes, what can I help you? He said, remember in the 90s, <laughs> uh, we prepared a very thick project book that was presented to the uh, Casablanca summit, uh, Amman summit, and Cairo summit, 94, 95, 96, uh, which really brought the vision for the new Middle East. I said, yes, I remember. I was one of the uh, young people working on that book at that time. I said, 
I think that we have to write this book again. I said, well, okay, but we don't write a book now. We do it online because the world has changed since the 90s. And we started actually to think together how to put, how to utilize, how to take advantage of this uh, impressive change. And, you know, you sit here in beautiful Princeton, far from the dust, noise, heat of the region, and you cannot feel the excitement of us staying there. We have no clue where it will lead. We have no clue. All those who are horrified, mainly in Israel, about this moves in the Arab world, and all those extremely optimistic that here democracy is coming to the Middle East, they're both wrong. Okay? We don't know what's going on. But we do know one thing. If we will not try to intervene to, um, to somehow maneuver or uh, try to influence to which direction this uh, uh, wild car is driving, the bad guys, the fundamentalists, who know where this car should reach, they will win, and we will not allow it. This is the logic, the deep logic behind the platform of, of, uh, of Yala. Young people, 200,000 today? 200,000 people showed interest in what? In communicating with like-minded people, even arguing. I'm a negotiator. The most important for me is engage. Even if we disagree, actually it's better if we disagree, because if not, I will not have any work. <laughs> uh, uh, they, they engage. They engage in heated conversations about what? About everything. So the Facebook provided a platform, a vehicle, and now, as, as Megan and Maddie started to describe, we start, we, it's, it's, I don't know who are the we, okay? These are the we, uh, many people are the we, no one owns the Facebook, no one owns the group, but some people started to put together uh, or to utilize this network in three layers. First layer is the academy, the law. Why? Because this platform will not bring peace. But this platform will make education accessible to the masses. And with the amazing development in the academic world, Coursera and other online platform, people who never have thought of gaining knowledge from Princeton professor sit and study and get the work done. So we are in the process, and Megan was very humble, but she's the, the person behind the application process. And uh, uh, we started an application process to open within Coursera a closed uh, site. The first it will be 300, but then 3,000, and then 30,000 people who will get high-level education things that their parents never dream of. Second layer is the uh, projects. Because what we realize it, is that people overcome differences when they work on something together. So we identified cool projects like online accelerators, like uh, football, like art, like language, uh, like alternative tourism, which means instead of taking your girlfriend to a romantic uh, tour in Paris, try to come to the Judea Mountains or walk through the Abraham Pass, travel to uh, Palestine, uh, Jerusalem, Jordan. Believe me, the bond with your girlfriend will be much stronger. <laughs> Mainly if you do it in August. <laughs> Uh, so so we, we, uh, that, that's the level of the project. 
because by the end of the day, we in the Middle East say we need, in order to become uh, uh, good friends, we need to uh, smell each other. You know, we, we need to feel each other. We touch uh, Middle East. And, uh, and, and, and the third level is the political statement, because we do want to offer a political statement of regional cooperation, coexistence, Sometimes we might even use the word peace, but not necessarily. Uh, a regional uh, initiative that says, in the long run, we, the young people, not we, they, uh, the young people do believe in, uh, in, um, in the Middle East with significantly less wars, not necessarily peace, okay? But definitely a civilized way to deal with their conflicts. By the way, there are hundreds of conflicts between US and Canada, hundreds. But they deal with it differently. And I see no reason why Israelis, Egyptians, not to mention Egyptians and Libyans, not to say uh, Turks and Syrians, will deal with their uh, differences, not necessarily through shelling uh, uh, each other. Um, 11 minutes. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Provost, for inviting me to this um, to this very inspiring group. It's really wonderful to be a, a part of it today and to hear these um, great presentations. I'm here in a different capacity than the rest of the panel because I'm not a Middle Eastern expert and. I am um, somebody who comes to this as a person who teaches introduction to sociology and taught an online class this summer. And when presented with the question on the poster for today, which was <coughs> what is the potential for online communities to help people overcome um, separations, great separations along the lines of politics and culture, I tried to think a little bit about my own experience teaching an online class this summer and how it might help me reflect upon this issue. And hopefully it will be somewhat complementary to the uh, issues that were raised by the other members of the panel. The class that I taught was a very scary experience for me from the very beginning because I knew that unlike classes like computer science and statistics, which had been at the forefront of Coursera, when it began, sociology is a topic that the questions and the answers are going to be very different depending upon where you sit in the world and where you take your class. And the thought of trying to speak to 40,000 students, which by the way, in this day and age is a small seminar online. You know, <laughs> That's not a big class anymore. But the thought of trying to speak to 40,000 people, uh, 40,000 students from 114 different countries at the same time and take concepts that came significantly out of American sociology um, with its imperialist traditions um, and to try to you know, bring, present those in a way that was going to be meaningful to people around the world and also not offensive was a significant challenge. And there were a couple of sort of um, things happened that surprised me. The first was this, was that I knew from the start that being in an online course and talking about subjects of the kind that I talk about in my classes, including just this past year at Princeton, um, the torture at Abu Ghraib or the um, Arab Spring or in previous years, the situation in Gaza, I knew that talking about those things online was potentially going to be very complicated, especially with a large Middle Eastern audience. And in particular, because online, people are free to write whatever they want and to say whatever they want. The same kind of inhibitions that they experience in a classroom are not present when they're anonymous on the web. And so I was really afraid that perhaps we would have um, some kind of breakdown or that people would be writing offensive things to one another and that the overall goals of the course would kind of get usurped um, in a political discussion that was very difficult for me to really control and that could become quite emotional um, at times. And the interesting thing was that that did not occur. 
that the people that were taking this class seemed to be much more interested in arguing about the meaning of C. Wright Mills's third paragraph in the sociological imagination um, and discussing the significance of that paragraph for their lives than they were in trying to take what I said about the Arab Spring um, or what I said about the torture and turn it into a larger uh, discussion that was going to cause a rift on the course discussions and the course website. And much of what we have occur, we do on, in the course occurs in writing uh, in these course forums, but we also have a live weekly discussion in which people from different parts of the world come together. Um, one of them who is from Kathmandu is visiting us today um, in the audience. And we had, uh, as part of that ongoing weekly group, um, a man from, from Tehran, and we had people from Singapore and from a variety uh, of places at, at the same time. And what we found was that both in the live forums and in the discussion forums that th it, was a, it was an atmosphere that was devoted to um, thinking about many of the smaller details uh, that we were trying to get at in the text and that I was hoping that the students would focus on rather than <coughs> things that were really not intended to be the main focus of debate. Now, it kind of reminded me a little bit of your wonderful comments because I felt as though there were times at which for the people taking the class, it was much more meaningful that the, you, you talked about people having discussions about the day or the weather and things like that. And I felt as though sort of the functional equivalent of that in my class was sitting there and wanting to talk about, well, how does face-to-face uh, -face communication work in the various uh, parts of the world and how does it change and how, how is it different? People could find a commonality um, in their interest in topics of that kind that they might not have been able to find in the bigger political issues. And so how do I explain this? Well, the main thing that occurred to me as I was teaching the class was that if we were to divide the world in the most simplistic of ways, and I would never do this, even in an intro to sociology class, I would never teach my students this, but if we were to divide it in the most simplistic of ways between the open-minded people and the closed-minded people, or perhaps the cosmopolitans and the ethnocentrists, that the people that enrolled in this class, that selected into this class, they were really interested in being open-minded. They were interested in, in cosmopolitanism. They were interested in civility. And they were interested in developing ties with people who were different than themselves, but also who were very similar than themselves. And so it kind of brings me back to the question. On the one hand, yes, I think that online communities can help us to develop ties among people with very different politics, but not necessarily among people with very different cultures. If we think of culture as a kind of value, a value of open-mindedness, of civility, um, of cosmopolitanism, I think that what we have here is a kind of unity that is occurring among people who come from that culture, that world culture, who are coming together and they're saying, we want to have contact with one another. Now, the next question is, and this is the question that I can't answer, um, but my friends in political science will have more of a grasp of, is how do we turn that into a dialogue that can help solve political problems? And with that, I will turn to um, my colleague in the political science <laughs> Provost Eisgruber, distinguished panelists, kind audience. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and to be amongst you and to be engaged in this dialogue. Um, so I'm here, I'm tasked with the, the assignment of speaking about civil society and the merits of civil society and how the Yalla Initiative can enhance uh, some of the goals um, underlying concepts of civil society. So I, I, I'm not gonna be able to answer your question just yet, but I'm gonna probably pose it back to the panel as well. So when we think about civil society or what, what mechanisms might emerge from civil society that might enable or, or help this group accomplish its goals, which is basically to understand one another better, um, to coexist, although I've, I've, I'm beginning not to, to be a fan of the word coexistence as much as we should not only aim for coexistence, we should aim for reconciliation. 
And if this indeed is a vehicle about coexistence and reconciliation, um, and we think about it from the civil society perspective, which is it's created a space where people can come together to engage one another, to learn from one another, to understand one another, to see each other's human side, then in many ways the Yalla Initiative is extraordinarily successful. But it's even more successful than that. And let me tell you why. Let me, let me draw on my own experience. I was evaluating proposals for uh, an organization that I will not name, um, and organizations to, uh, sorry, proposals to enhance civil society in the, in the Middle East. And we received hundreds, hundreds of proposals, and of course the budget was limited. And several proposals came in that basically said, you know, this NGO is going to bring the youth together to either play basketball, to, or this NGO is going to bring, bring uh, workers together so they can harvest the fields together. These were all noble applications, don't get me wrong. They were all designed to enhance cooperation, mutual recognition, mutual understanding. But at some point, you say, well, how many NGOs are we going to support, right? We have to support some other projects. And so the funding and, and the idea, that it, it, there's a limit on the number of initiatives that you're going to support that will just um, finance basic infra infrastructure and operation costs. So this is the genius of, of Yalla. It's basically a, 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 a space, uh, a forum, that can reach 200,000 people online at a very, it's, it's very cost effective and you are able to accomplish, in my opinion, more than, you know, what millions and millions of dollars poured into reconciliation can't accomplish. So bravo on that, on that side of, uh, on, on that accomplishment. But furthermore, um, I, I, this weekend, again, drawing on my own experience, this weekend I had the, the great opportunity um, and privileged to watch this new sitcom, what's not really new in Israel. Um, it's been out since 2008, 2009, but it's called Arab Labor. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, 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 it's just a really fantastic sitcom um, that airs in Israel. And it's actually, what it, it still attracts yeah. about 20% yeah. of any audience viewership, and it's about the Arab minority in Israel. And I think Arab Labor is doing for the Arab minority in Israel what years and years and years of public diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis civil society associations could not accomplish. Because through humor, through seeing, again, the experiences of both Israelis and Arabs together on screen is creating such mutual understanding uh, th through humor, through uh, poking fun of each other, through revealing to each other your own prejudices, and confronting them and putting them and being honest about them. And again, through this med medium of technology and dissemination, we are beginning to lay the groundworks for a, what, what I say, not only coexistence, but reconciliation. So again, bravo. Um, but there are challenges still ahead, right, for groups like Yalla. And so this point was raised by my colleague in sociology, uh, my, my, my colleague, which is, um, are we only attracting individuals who are, all, who are already predisposed to the goals of Yalla. And I don't, that, that might be a concern, but I don't think so, especially when you're dealing with the youth population, especially when you're dealing with a youth population that is getting mixed signals from the region. In this new era, this new global era of media, where, where, where the average individual is getting broadcast signals from a variety of news media, coming from all across the spectrum, to have a vehicle like Yalla can help basically channel and mainstream certain, um, certain uh, interactions, certain predispositions, certain orientations about one another. So again, that's another reason to really feel, you know, to, to be proud of this, this initiative. Um, again, this has create created a large platform that has the ability to reach thousands of, of individuals and it should, you know, you should continue to broadcast in, you know, various Arab countries in Israel, in the Pal in Palestine, and into other um, Arab countries. I think getting attraction also in the West here is extremely important because I'm thinking about another initiative several years ago at the eve of Oslo, which was Seeds of Peace, that uh, obtained a lot of um, recognition here in the United States, but that attention uh, waned, more or less. I mean, that program is still ongoing. A limited number of students are in that program each year, but only about, what, 20, 20 students a year from each side um, are invited. Not all students can afford. So this is really a cost-effective medium um, to reach a large uh, segment of the population. So I, I do believe that Yalla is designed to create the basic foundations of what is needed in this conflict, 
my only hope, and I guess posing the question back to the panel, is that the political leadership on both sides can seize on the opportunity, can seize on the momentum to reflect the, the desires of the, of the youth population. Because as we saw with Oslo, right, there was a tendency towards reconciliation. There was a moment in the Oslo period by 93, 94, before the wave of violence in 95, where we began to hear about reconciliation, where we began to hear about the humanization on both sides of the spectrum. I mean, one of the big ironies about Oslo is not only that we didn't get to a peace uh, settlement, but is that that, 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 that trust, if you may, Right? Building trust is important in, in this conflict. That trust that was there, that was beginning to emerge, was totally shattered. And not only was it shattered, but it became part of the problem. Because we trusted one another, this is what happened. Right? Because we thought that the other side was going to care or trust us, this is what happened. And now both sides are further away than ever. So hopefully the Yalla initiative can reach a broader audience, win back, if you may, through this work, the people who are now really pulling this conflict in opposite directions, and hopefully you'll find an audience with uh, the political leadership. Thank you very much. Well, our speakers have done a tremendous job saying a lot in a short time. Moti Crystal said that uh, he believes in engagement. I believe in engagement, too. We have an opportunity now for engagement, so we are open for questions. Stan Katz. I just have a straightforward request for information. I think the, the notion of the culture of platform is fascinating, uh, but everything depends upon what you put on it. And I wonder whether you have even an initial notion of what the content uh, would be because you can imagine all sorts of a parade of horribles that you don't want. What do you want? Um, we have a pilot that we're going to begin in January, a one-year pilot to uh, begin to work out these questions. And for that pilot, we have selected about uh, nine courses um, most of which are on Coursera, a few that are being given directly to us from other universities not on Coursera, um, one of which is Introduction to Sociology. Um, <coughs> we have another from Princeton, which is Network <coughs> Rights and Money. Taught by Professor Meng Chang, yes. Yeah. And uh, a, a variety of others from Sabanchi University in Turkey. We have um, International Relations. Uh, we have also some business and technology oriented courses. Um, our goal is to have three main areas. One is business and technology. The other is regional peace studies. And the other is uh, modern political activism and diplomacy. Can you just, uh, uh, following that, can you just uh, say a little bit about the survey and what came out of people who would like to participate? Yeah, we did a, an online survey of our members uh, to find out what it is that they, what their background is, uh, what they're currently engaged in studying, and what, or what degree they've already obtained, um, and what they're interested in doing in their careers, and skills that they're interested in gaining. Um, and we had a lot of uh, responses that surprised us. We thought most of the interest would be geared because employment is such an issue in the region. Uh, we thought most of the interest would be in business and technology. Um, but we found actually that a lot of the interest was geared more towards good governance and political activism, negotiation and mediation, um, as well as um, the other one, the, the regional uh, peace studies as well. So um, we incorporated that in, in further developing our um, fields of study. Uh, we're still keeping, obviously, the business and technology as that is important, and there was um, interest, just not as much as, as we had originally um, thought. And our members really have goals for their career as varied as, as any diverse group. We had a lot who, you know, hope someday to be president or to run their own businesses, um, things like that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very interesting. Of course, we manipulated the result to introduce uh, <laughs> introduction to French cuisine. <laughs> <laughs> we have an Italian cooking course here in our curriculum, <laughs> gastronomy, <laughs> but, okay, okay. but not French. <laughs> Professor Shepley. Uh, yeah, this is really a fascinating initiative, and I wonder what language all this happens in. 
that's a sorting device, you know. So the Coursera courses are probably going to be in English. And I'm wondering how English is distributed around the region, who has it, is Facebook going on in Arabic and Hebrew? Uh, so t talk to me about languages and who speaks <coughs> them and how that affects who you reach. Um, it, well, the online courses will be in English. But that is because it's mostly requested by the people who took the surveys because they want to advance themselves in English. They want to immerse themselves in the language. But uh, obviously Facebook does have, you could, in any language that's out there, you can have your Facebook <coughs> be in Arabic, you can have it be in Hebrew, and, and anything. Uh, but the, the majority of, of the people that, that did the surveys and everything were very much interested in, in it being in English. And, um, but on our Facebook page, um, there is interaction happening sometimes in Arabic, sometimes in Hebrew, the majority uh, in English, sometimes in French, also from our Maghreb uh, country members. But the majority is in English. And Google Translate is not all that it's set up. <laughs> <laughs> we have Google Peace Translators who like uh, manipulate it. <laughs> Question all the way in the back. Is attracting any youthful fundamentalist voices? And are you experiencing any pushback from more fundamentalist uh, <coughs> adults or, or older people, should we say? Uh, well, obviously, yeah, it's the Middle East. Not everyone's all like, yay, peace, let's do this. So, I mean, <laughs> it, 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 we do have a large, very large youth. Uh, segment of youth that are all for it, and they're just 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 interested, and they're just yearning for that that connection, and just they're just very curious. But it, w at the same point in time, we do have people who are mainly an older crowd, but you do have it in the youth as well that that aren't all for it just because they're skeptical, they're they're suspicious. You know, conspiracy theorists are very big in the Middle East. Um, Especially when it pertains to Israel, to be very blunt, Israel being connected with this project did have a lot of repercussions with people publicly saying, if you're from an Arab country and you want to publicly be in Yalla, that, that, might, that might be a problem for you. You might look at the idea of normalization in the Arab world, I think is something that needs to be addressed. And uh, we've, we have had members who, who have felt the need to not publicize their names and kind of hide their origins on Facebook. Uh, for good reason, they have every right to do so. Uh, but it is, a majority of it is people who are just, they don't care what their governments restrict. A lot of, peop a lot of governments do restrict Facebook, do restrict Twitter. But people get around it, you know, proxy sites, there's... Uh, if you're interested and you're truly yearning for it, there's always a way to get around it. But we do we do have people who who, who push that that say if you're an Arab and you join this, you, you're a traitor. You're you're just you're giving up. You're you're being double-sided, and it's you know it, it is there. It is there, and uh, we've yet to address it. I don't know if if that can be addressed very in in, in one short answer, but the problem persists. Yes, here. Um, uh, 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 but to follow up with a question just asked, couldn't your organization could be the platform for the, for the fundamentalists and, and, and to, and to uh, uh, spread the uh, uh, misinformation? To spread uh, fundamentalist information? Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, honestly, no, because a majority, a majority of our, of our 200,000 members are not uh, are not spreading a, a more conservative fundamentalist view. It, we do have, as in the internet world, we like to call them trolls <laughs> for Facebook, the people who will, who will spam and just, just drench the page with all these links and, and their very opinionated conservative fundamentalist views. But it's, it's nothing that affects the site. If you were to just join Yalla today and you were to look at the page, it wouldn't be filled a majority of it would be filled with our posts, with posts from our, our members in their respective countries, uh, but it, it wouldn't be an overwhelming sense of, of a fundamentalist view. Professor Jamal. Yeah, I just want to chime in on this issue of the stigma linked to the, the youth embracing normalization activity in some countries where even that have 
more or less normalized relationships with Israel, they still don't uh, sanction normalization at the civil society level with Israel. So for these youth to be openly joining on Facebook and seeking uh, and, and, and participating is a huge testament of, 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 of wanting to at least be in dialogue with the other side, um, if we want to label it that way. Um, you know, even, even there are a lot of, you know, friends that we have and we know that we cannot travel freely between countries if they're seen as, quote unquote, the normalizers. So I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, I'm from Nepal and uh, well, 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 though we have a completely uh, different political situation, but we do have a similar kind of um, Facebook movement, especially social media movement that are going on. And uh, in the last four years, what we have seen is uh, at one time there was a craze for this. Um, uh, we have uh, out of total uh, our population, 13% of the population, uh, they have access to internet and out of them 97% use Facebook. So in this context, uh, and we have uh, two thirds of our population is young population is below 35. So. Uh, in the last four years uh, in Nepal, uh, the political change that has gone through, uh, we just overcame uh, through the 12-hour long internal conflict. And after that, we, we used to have a series of uh, bondage that, uh, that we call strike. So we used to have that, and uh, there was uh, dissatisfaction among young people. So they started with the Facebook uh, page. And uh, what happened uh, in the initial days, in the last two years, uh, uh, they, they organized a lot of um, uh, physical gatherings as well where they were defying, uh, defying this kind of strikes. Uh, uh, when we look at uh, now, when we look at, at this end, uh, we have the crazes going down among the youngsters. So my question basically is how can uh, Yala maintain the craze that, is, that you guys have right now uh, in the next two years or next three years uh, about the sustainability of the craze that you have now? Uh, what are the strategies that you are applying to do that? We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. It might turn into a political movement, peace for the Middle East. It might turn. It might disappear because something else will turn. I, I think that that's my uh, what, what 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 we're trying to say. Like we have a constituency, <coughs> and we need to provide. We like the general. We need to provide these people, these young people with projects, with education, with continuous excitement. Um, unlike other social um, movements that utilize the uh, people towards uh, very clear operational objectives, like Wall Street, Occupy Wall Street, or uh, in, in Israel it was the uh, social justice uh, uh, this, this doesn't have one political goal, okay? Uh, so, honestly, in the internet world, I just don't know. I, I have to say that's the first time I've heard Occupy Wall Street described as having clear strategic <laughs> objectives. <laughs> many, many of us here wondered exactly. Well, you know, uh, 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 there were many strategic no, objectives. No, no, no. Uh, well, you know, one of the goals of Fiala is end occupation. Yes. Occupation of what? Mm -hmm. Of Wall Street. <laughs> let me, if, there, if there's a moment here, let, let, let me uh, tag on to the um, question from our visitor from Nepal, who's one of uh, Professor De Niro's 40,000 students, right, who has come for office hours, I guess, a <laughs> uh, long, long way, and, and just pick up on a question that I think it was Professor De Niro asked about next steps by uh, political leaders. Is there, you, you don't know what the movement may become. Uh, clearly, you're taking some steps to uh, keep political leaders aware of what's happening. You mentioned the, the response from the U.S. State Department that you had received today, are there things that you're looking for uh, from them or things that will be important to this or do you want them simply to be aware of what's happening in this domain? No, we want them definitely to listen to us, um, but how to achieve that is a very difficult question and so we're, I guess, engaging a little bit in trial and error and, and, and seeing what resonates uh, the most and continuing our <coughs> online uh, conferences. We'll have our second annual online conference uh, December 18th. Um, so that'll be another opportunity um, to 
really bring together our, our membership base and then um, depending on the outcomes of that conference, communicate those again to the leaders, uh, again <coughs> reminding them that we are here, this is our voice, please give us opportunities to, to really affect change. And um, if you do go to our page um, on Facebook, we do have um, support from Mahmoud Abbas, the pre president of the Palestinian Authority, and we also have uh, obviously Shimon Peres' support. But at the same time, I would like to say that the support from the PA and from the Israeli, uh, well, the you know Israeli government, respectively, is kind of it's there and it isn't. You know, we have technically we do have the support of the PA, but when it comes down to it, we you know they wouldn't make a video for us because it was too politically sensitive, and and if they're not negotiating with Israel, we shouldn't be having negotiations so it is it's just it's very it's a political mess but we we do have relations with the governments just at the same time that's good and bad that we don't we're not very close with them because we don't want to associate ourselves with the old, old way of, of doing things but uh, but we are also uh, working with Avaz <coughs> it's a online petition site where you just you you gather people that send thousands of petitions for governments to to stop. Uh, we recently just had a petition for Syria that Avaz helped us with and we had a couple thousand people send petitions to pressure the Syrian government to stop the onslaught on c uh, civilians. So I mean, we're, we're working slowly with, with organizations like that. Professor Jamal. Yeah, and, and, and I guess because I'm a Princeton professor, I can instigate. Um, <laughs> given the fact that, I mean, what, what, what the, Again, one of the things that civil society can accomplish is basically be a counterbalance to the state. And you, if your size of momentum grows, maybe you ha you can have potentially the ability to pull the, the leadership your way. So. Right, right, exactly. I guess our long-term strategy is just to become so big that they can't not listen to us. <laughs> the back row over here. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm very grateful for all of your contributions. Uh, from some of the comments, it seems to me that fundamentalist, the word use of the word fundamentalist could be read as religious, and cosmopolitan and peace-loving and uh, humanistic interest <coughs> could be read as secular, and that the movement could be perceived uh, as an anti-religious opportunity for young people. So I'm wondering if you have any plans to help people in the region identify those aspects of their traditional religious commitments that promote the values of Yalla and help people who wouldn't immediately see those dimensions develop a more nuanced understanding of the contribution that the religions themselves can make toward peace and civil society. I'll just have a small comment, but um, I think you, you can't alienate the religious community. This is the Middle East, after all, and most people are religious, and if they're not devoutly religious, they'll associate themselves with being Muslim, with being uh, with being Christian, with being a Coptic Christian. You know, it just religion is not only religious, but it's cultural in the Middle East. I know that may be yes. hard to understand, but it's very much a cultural <laughs> A cultural thing, and you can't ignore that fact. Um, although, when you state that it's a, it's 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 either religious or it's either totally secular, secular. I don't I don't think it's <coughs> either I'm just or. You could, from what I've been hearing, oh, it could yeah. be perceived yeah. that way. I'm not saying that that's what you're intending, mm -hmm. but it could be perceived that way from some of the rhetoric. Yeah, yeah, and I I, I understand. Um, it. I think we need to try to work as hard as as hard as we can to just intertwine the, the two because, as I said, it is the Middle East and you have to confront religion. And a lot of our a lot of our members from the Arab countries are religious who do uh, who do have um, a religious background that they're not afraid to talk about. Who, in a lot of ways, if you if we were to exclude religion on Yalla, I think it would be very detrimental. And a lot of people wouldn't wouldn't want to join because it's not something that they would value. Because religion, religion is very much valued in the Middle East. And we need, as I just said, we need to find a way to intertwine the two. 
Yes, I think there's a question over here. Um, thanks. It's inspiring to hear that there's a sustained commitment um, from youth in the in the Middle East um, to political activism. And it, but the discussion reminds me of the positions that many youth um, in Tahrir and in Upper Egypt, Lower Egypt, um, held last summer in 2011 when I was there interviewing them. A lot of them um, said that they didn't want to participate in institutionalized politics because of the negative experiences they had and because their power derived precisely from being outside of the system, from being in the streets and the square. And so I'm wondering how Yella mediates between youth who say, I want to be involved in political activism, but I'm not going to talk with those, the old folks with the traditional power structure. I want to be on the outside. It's a good question. Um, I think we're still trying to work through that. And um, in a way, it's, it's not really realistic, I think, to say we're not going to engage with the old order. In, in the end, they are the ones in power, and, and you need to engage uh, with them if you're going to change everything, or anything, I should say. Um, but we, one of the things that we hope to do with our projects and with our activities is to help our members find ways to, to become active because many of them want to become active, but they don't necessarily know how. And uh, so I had a very interesting meeting this morning with the PACE Center, which deals a lot with civic engagement. And, and that's something that I hope we can work together on to try to bring um, our members <coughs> training and tools to help them um, become engaged. Yes, here. Oh, I was, um, yeah, I guess anyway, I first want to say that I'm just incredibly inspired and it's very nice to have this discussion. Um, one thing I wanted to comment on was both with regard to your courses and from what I'm hearing from you is, um, you know, when I've been reading, following the news over the last year, and I occasionally I go and read Arab newspapers, and I go and read Israeli newspapers, and I see what they comment on each other, and I notice, you know, how everyone, just as I, you know, I mean, they, um, they are right next to each other, as you said, 20 minutes apart. You don't know each other's history, traditions, politics too well this, without this you know, this, this smear that's been put over it by your society, okay, your upbringing. And this offers a potential for change. And I was wondering whether you can maybe, both through courses, I'd be surprised if there wasn't more interest. You know, you said there was interest in governance. Um, you know, one of the things I felt growing up in India, even if it was, you know, 20 years after independence, but you were constantly, you know, what was India? What was the concept of government and what was development? This was constant discussion, and it continues today. And I'd be surprised if that wasn't true in the Middle East. And so young people should want to understand forms of government and what has succeeded, and that might be one thing to study, even Western models or, you know, models all over the to try and understand that. It's the same thing with understanding your religion and history. I mean, you, you don't have to have fundamentalism in a bad way, but just uh, to get a better sense of who you are as a nation. And uh, I thought that would be kind of nice. So that's something to approach in the courses. And then can you consider having guest speakers who are moderates? Maybe somebody who puts across a religious perspective on something that's a divisive issue that everyone's arguing about, maybe not from the government, but someone who you choose and you have panelists and have a conference where people can engage with this person. Maybe it's a somewhat controversial issue, but it's not the government exactly. So something sort of midway. I don't know whether you've tried that or considered that. Yeah, definitely. Um, one of our dreams is to have sort of a comparative governance course that compares all the different <coughs> models um, and, and discusses what, what could be an interesting model for the Middle East, because not necessarily it's, it's the models that um, have worked in the West, and it would be a very interesting course. Um, so we do hope to have one of those in the future. Um, and definitely guest speakers would be a, a very good idea. I, mean, I, I should perhaps have there my, my sense from um, our, our guests from Yala is that they would love it if they were able to um, induce these kinds of uh, courses. The Coursera model enables them to, in a sense, piggyback on the offerings that are already uh, there. But I know that their fond hopes are that 
some of our faculty who teach in that area will choose to participate in that uh, program or that others at other universities uh, will, and that would give them more capacity to do that, if that were true. Dean Bowden. Um, it's my sense that Yella is a relatively, relatively low-cost project, but you have donors. Do you ever experience um, agendas from those donors, we messaging? Have, we don't have. Very few donors. <laughs> I, I'm just going on what I learned from them over lunch. The State Department. Yeah, the State Department is a, is a new um, partner just actually coming on board uh, this month. And the, I have to say, the State Department has more of an agenda than, than our other donors. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, we hope we'll be able to accommodate that. I think we'll find ways to, to achieve our mutual goals. But yes, um, the State Department has much more of an agenda than our other donors, the government of Italy, the government of Norway. The <laughs> Always the case, Professor Jamal says. Yes, it's good in terms of capacity, but there are strings attached. When yes. The State Department. Yes, you're in the center. But I'll come back to the it seems that um, you've transitioned from a forum on Facebook to have a discussion to an organization. And uh, an important thing for organizations and organizational design is to have a mission statement. I'm wondering, do you have a mission statement? We do have a declaration of our principles, and um, it actually took, we, we waited a while to to state something political. In the beginning, we, we just stayed clear. We didn't want to say anything political. We didn't want to be biased. It's very hard being neutral, so we steered away from that. But as we as we grew, I, I like to say as we grew older with Yalba, uh, we felt more comfortable stating that we are we are for a two-state solution. We're an end to we're for an end to occupation. We are for mutual recognition of one another, and we really finalized that in our in our participation in the Berlin Peace Summit, where we finalized our stance and we made it very clear that this is what we stand for and this is this is what we want. So yes. Let let, let me present a little bit of uh, gaps. Okay, it's not that I'm uh, younger, or I don't even have Facebook, but uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm not necessarily agree with my uh, young colleagues, and uh, I'm afraid of what uh, you were saying about turning into an organization, because organizations have agendas. Organizations need money. Organizations <coughs> enter into negotiations rather than a dialogue, which is structurally and conceptually different uh, uh, thing, okay? Uh, this is why one of the reasons that I keep uh, disturbing uh, the YALA work is to make sure that it maintains its network, uh, loose network uh, structure rather than becoming another peace uh, organization because uh, we had so many very successful peace organizations in the Middle East uh, we don't really want to go <laughs> It's almost as worse as the Jewish word, by the way. Yeah, another Jewish organization. We, 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 we definitely don't want that. So I, I am going to go to Professor Katz for a last question, and then I will ask each of our panelists whether they want to make a last comment. And I think I'll do it in reverse order from which they spoke. So I'll start with Professor Jamal. Professor Katz, last question. Well, I'm going to ask a different question than I posed. It's not a question really, but it's provoked by what Bodhi just said and by this, this question. Uh, you know, you have to be careful what you wish for. Um, that's rule one. Um, I'm going to ask, I'm not going to say anything more about this guy. I'm going to ask Mitch to explain at dinner what um, institutional isomorphism is. That's what you have to look out for. Um, our experience with organizations of this kind is they tend to the same forms in the end. And I would suggest that in the end, what we know is that Modi's wrong. You, if you're going to continue, the longer you continue, the more organized you have to become. And that bears on the original question, because what you just outlined, uh, is really, I would say, not a strategic um, statement, uh, but rather a series of political goals, which I'm happy to share and, and support. It's not a mobilizational strategy. And I, what I haven't heard yet is what organizational strategy is going forward. So I think it's a big move from where you are now, where I hope you will be 
in a few years. One of my colleagues says you can always turn a comment like that into a question by adding at the end of it, isn't that so? But <laughs> 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 then you can go on to reply to the implied question. You said it wasn't a question, but I, I want to give our panel a chance to respond directly if, anybody, if any of them want to say anything about institutional isomorphism or other aspects of that uh, query. If not, it's, it's, well, it's not a question, so I, I am going to go for concluding remarks then to, yeah. What? Let's make sure that nobody wanted to respond. Uh, okay. I guess part of my concluding remarks will, will address the, is, isn't that so? Uh, <laughs> I, I think in many ways we might be in new terrain here, right? Because here we have an online community that is trying to basically transcend borders, bring a community together to sustain dialogue with the hope of reaching some kind of political objective. Now, whether that becomes uh, institutionalized or remains sort of like a loose network of individuals, at the end of the day, you need to keep that momentum going. And, and I'm not, at, the truth is, I'm not exactly sure. I don't think we've ever seen this. Um, you know, in, in many ways, if you look at um, mobilizational cascades, they normally happen with collective action on the ground. Sorry to use political science jargon. People go out and they demonstrate or they do something of that sort. How are you going to keep and maintain a mobilizational cascade, if you may, online is uh, is going to be a difficult task. Um, what I did hear, though, is that there are there will be groups coming in with certain agendas and trying to steer your direction. Um, there's going to be debates about the politicization of your organization. Are you too pro-Palestinian? Are you too pro-Israeli? Um, and I think you're going to have to steer clear of all of that. Um, I mean, I can tell you what not to do, but I'm not really sure what to say in terms of how you're going to do it. Um, and I don't know if, uh, who, who do we go to for that type of online knowledge? Um, sorry, it wasn't really helpful. <laughs> so I just want to say I'm really looking forward to working with Yala and um, I'm really honored that my class will be a part of this curriculum and I also want to say that I hope that Professor Jamal offers a class on Coursera soon too Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I was, uh, I was uh, thinking about the schnitzel and, uh, and uh, strawberry jam uh, it seems completely stupid I know. Uh, no? This going to be an insight, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 the, the, uh, uh, um, we are trying to do something different, new. Uh, let's try not to uh, categorize it as past experience. Why? Just because everything we tried in the past failed. Okay? And suddenly, our people stood up. The Arab people, the Tunisian, the Egyptians, and we see a change. We have no clue where this change will, uh, will lead us. We must try new things. We will fail. We'll fail. That's fine. You know, and we will succeed. That will be a big war. Uh, so that was my last thing. Thank you. I don't know. I was a hundred. It's... it's it doesn't exist really as a dish, so this also it's a new thing, I think. <laughs> Don't try at home schnitzel in general. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Okay. Um, yeah, I agree with all of my distinguished <laughs> panelists. We are trying to do something new. Um, we don't want to be stuck in the in the old boxes, so uh, we don't really have a clear answer to the question of our organizational. Uh, structure and, and strategy, but uh, we are experimenting. We have our core organizations that were the co-founders, the Paris Center for Peace and Yalla Palestine that are sort of the motor behind uh, what we're doing, but we also have our steering committee of members all over uh, the region, and they are taking on different roles and responsibilities, and we don't know structurally, organizationally, where that will lead us, but we are definitely trying to experiment and, and find new ways. So let's see where it brings us. Mahadi Jaber. And to give you another obfuscated answer, <laughs> is, is, as we've all just said, it is very new. It's ever-evolving. There's, there's no, we never know what's going to happen. So I mean, it's it's just as I just said, it's ever evolving. We just we need to take it day by day, 
and we will try our hardest to stay true to our core values and not have interest groups take over and have this just become another movement in the peace industry that's rich and, and famous. But we will try just to stay true to what we what we were in the first couple weeks of Yalla. It was a true, genuine yearn for something new. And as long as we could stay with that, I think we're on a good path. Well, I will say in, in closing that uh, those of us who care about uh, coexistence and reconciliation, to use Amani's uh, terms in the Middle East, know that if anything is to succeed, it is going to have to be something new, and it's going to have to require a willingness to take chances on ventures that are uh, innovative and outside of the box. I'm grateful to our guests today for telling us about their venture of that kind. Grateful to all of you for coming, and I want to thank our terrific panelists for their presentations. Thank you. Thank you.